أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد المصطفى وعلى آله أهل الصفا وعلى أصحابه أهل الوفاء أما بعد أيها الحبة في الله فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, the ayah which we've been discussing the past few weeks, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالُ وَلَا بنون, The day in which mankind will not benefit or take any benefit from their mal, their wealth, وَلَا بنون, or will they take any benefit from their progeny, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهُ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ The only benefit for that day is those who come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart. And we've been discussing different characteristics that are required to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart. Characteristics that we need now and we need to implement now in our life while we have a chance so that we can go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart. And we began speaking of the station of tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this trust and tafweed the submission to him subhanahu wa ta'ala that you submit all of your affairs to him it's, uh, you realize that there is no no one who has power over any of your affairs and that all of your affairs are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the meaning of la hawla wa la quwwa there is no hawl no one has any power wa la quwwa and no one can do anything except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed so you see it all from him subhanahu wa ta'ala Right? You, you submit completely to him into the, and that he's the all-powerful subhanahu wa ta'ala. You submit to him and that he's the owner and the possessor of the entire dominion and the entire cosmos. He subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of it all. He's the owner of it all and so whatever he wills to do in his, in his cosmos and his universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the wisdom of it. We don't question I, the, the Muslim never questions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You never say, why? Why me? Why me? What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done is put us into situations and has asked us to act as best as we can in each situation. And that's our, our mission. It's to, we put into various situations. We put into various situations and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking you, how do you react? Right? So your, your, your reaction to it needs to be of the highest. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. It's not that, um, you know, everything is easy. Where does the test come? Right? Where does the test come? The test comes in the difficult times. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us through these difficulties to see who's the best. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمِلًا Who's the best? Right? And we've been speaking of this, the science which it, which it is, is the science of Ihsan, or Tazkiyah, or Ilmu Suluk. And this, the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the path of, of good character. And the, the hallmark of this science is good character. That's, that's what it's about. That if you don't have adab, then there's no ihsan. There's no ihsan without adab. And uh, adab and, and good character. Right? Adab, adab means to put something in its right place. The adib, the adib is, the, is the author. And adib is the author. Why? Because he puts words and he puts letters in a, in a specific place. And he puts it in the right place. And so when you read it, it has this impact on you. And similarly, is the one who, who has adab. He puts things in the right place. He acts in the right manner in each situation. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us adab. And not just information. And the information needs to lead to the adab. And should increase our adab. In front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, and then his beloved sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam second. And then adab with yourself and with the creation, with all the other creation. And we spoke, we began speaking of the, the hikmah of Ibn Atayillah where he says, من اعتماد, من الاعتماد على العمل نقصان الرجاء عند وجود الزلل. That from amongst the signs of one relying on his or her own good deeds, نقصان الرجاء is that the, he loses hope in the wujud zalal when when he stops doing that good deed 
so we mentioned that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to do good. It's a command. Aqim as salah Wa'mur bil ma'roof, wanha anil munkar, wasbir ala ma asabak. Look at this, this command. Aqim as salah Aqim as salah establish salah right? Not salli. Not just salli. Salli, those who pray, the Quran says, فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Wo- Woe to them. Allah always says in the Quran, Aqim as salah Establish salah. Why? Because the establishment of salah should result into something. What does it result in? Inna salah tatanha anil fahshai wal munkar. That this, when you're praying your salah, that it, it wards off uh, fahsha and munkar. If, you, if you're praying your salah, you should not find fahsha, vile, a shameful acts and munkar, wrong acts. Your salah should prevent you from that. But then you say, what's going on? I'm praying all my salah, I'm praying my five times salah. Why, why is it that I'm still engaged in that? Well, then we have to reflect on the presence in the salah and the benefit in the salah. There's something wrong there. Allah has promised us that if you in the salah tatanhan al fahsha, salah will prevent it. So if you find it, it means something else is wrong. It means something is wrong in the prayer. So the aqim al salah wa amur bil ma'roof command the good. Wanha an al munkar forbid the evil. Wasbir ala ma asabak, and be patient in the afflictions that come to you. Asab, be patient. After you pray your salah and you command the good and you forbid the evil, you better believe that difficulty will come your way. Well, one, you being a good a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are tested continuously. Continuously. Right? We've been speaking of uh, the different um, prophets who've, been, who've gone to different trials and tribulations. Those are the prophets of Allah. Those are the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah has put them through that. Allah has put them through that. This is, we, have, we know of, um, of generations who, like the Bani Israel, we, we see that they used to even kill their prophets. I forget just tribulations, death. That's part of being, a part of this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, part of being a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, وَأْمُرُ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْهَعَنِ الْمُنْكَرُ وَاسْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَتْ When you command the good, forbid the evil, you better believe people aren't going to be happy with you. Well, for one, shaitan is not going to be happy with you. He's not going to be happy. And so the tribulations in your life might come more. And you might find an increase in it. And if you find an increase in it, perhaps you can take contentment in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to come closer. And He wants you to come closer, so He's sending means. He's sending means to you to come closer to Him. That you turn to Him and you ask yourself, how many times do you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're in a difficult situation? Or life-threatening situation, or you know, it's it's really a grave moment. Who do you turn to? You turn to Allah. But in good times, ah, we forget. So perhaps Allah gives the bad times so that you don't forget Him and you don't become heedless of Him. But also, we need to turn to Him, and we need to turn to Him willingly. Willingly, it can't just be the entire time tribulation, tribulation. You also, turn to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala from your own. Right. So. من علامات الاعتماد على العمل from the signs of one depending on his good deeds نقصان الرجاء عند وجود الزلال is that you lose hope when this deed disappears and this this is the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that you're going to do and you're going to make mistakes that's, that's the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're going to do actions and you're going to make mistakes and the path to perfection for the angels is complete obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Complete obedience. They don't ever do anything wrong. Whereas the path of perfection for the creation is making a mistake and turning back to Him. That's how you attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah doesn't say, not once in the Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that Allah loves those who don't do any sins. No way. Allah doesn't say that. What, do we, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the tawabin, the tawabin, those who continuously, right? Not, not the ta'ib, the ta'ib, the one, the person who, who repents one time, ta'ib, the one time, tawabin continuously over and over, repetitively. Why do you need to repent, repent repetitively? Why do you continuously need to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and turn back to Him? Why? Because the hadith tells you, 
كلكم من بني ادم عفوا وخير الخطائين التوابين right الله سبحانه وتعالى كل بني ادم خطا that all of adam all of the children of adam everyone makes errors خطا وخير الخطائين right the best of those who do khata'in again we sing it right tawabin khata'in why khata'in you continuously making errors you continuously making mistakes you continuously falling and you getting back up wa khayru al khata'in at tawabin is those who continuously return to him if you want to get closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you want to the love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's, it's your turning back to him that that why you see the hadith uh, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says that the, that he would make istighfar to Allah in one day 70 times and another narration 100 times and 70 year and 100 year don't mean 70 times it means it's like to signify a lot for example if you if you tell someone oh, I told you a thousand times it doesn't mean you told them a thousand times what it means is that I've told you a lot I've told you a lot. It, it's to it's to imply um, a, a lot, and so when the, the Prophet sallallahu says he turns back to Allah and he makes istighfar seventy times, it means a lot. It means a lot, and that's the state of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Khayrul khalq, right? And uh, and Nabiul Aadham, right? Wal Habibul Akram, the, the the best, right? Imam al Mursalin, he's making. Istighfar 70 times and why why does the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam make istighfar? It doesn't commit any sense and I really like How one of my teachers explained this and he, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim alam nashrah lak sadrak wa Allahna an kawitrak alladhi anqada dhahrak wa rafa'na lak dhikrak Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that in surah in shurah that وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ And indeed we raise your status, Ya Rasulullah. Your status is raised. Your status is raised. So the Prophet ﷺ status is continuously being raised from perfection to a higher perfection. And from that perfection to a higher perfection. And from that perfection to a higher perfection. Continuously the Prophet ﷺ is going to a higher, higher level of perfection. So my teacher says that Perhaps the Prophet ﷺ is making istighfar from his previous state with Allah. It's not as high as his current state with Allah. And then immediately he needs to make istighfar again because his current state is not as high as his, in the next state. And he's continuously being elevated and continuously raised in the rank in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore he continuously makes istighfar on the previous, uh, on the previous rank. And that's perhaps one interpretation on why the Prophet ﷺ makes istighfar 70 times a day. But the point is that we need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa tubu ila Allah jami'an ayyuhal mu'minun. That turn to Him all together. Right? All together ayyuhal mu'min. And especially in these times we need a, a collective return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Individual, yes. Individual but also a collective. Why? Because the ayah tells us. Tubu ila Allah jami'a, all together. Everyone needs to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wherever you are, whichever place you find yourself in, whatever situation you find yourself in, we all need to turn back to Him. All together. Jami'an ayyuhal mu'minun. All those who believe, la'allakum tuflihun. Perhaps, la'alla, perhaps you may be successful. La'allakum tuflihun. Perhaps you may be successful. Successful in what? Well, what do you want success in? You want success in the dunya, you want success in the akhirah. Well, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left it open to tell you that if you make istighfar to him, you'll have success in the dunya and in the akhirah. It's not, Allah could have said, fil akhirah, that you would be successful in the akhirah, which is the primary objective. But also people want success in the dunya. And so it's there. That's why we, I think we mentioned, in one of the weeks that when they came to Sayyidina Umar and they asked him, you know, we want wealth and he said, make istighfar and he, he, he said, they said, well, we want water um, to rain on our farms. He said, make istighfar and they want to get married, make istighfar. And they said, and the student said, everyone comes, you you say, make istighfar. They all want different things out. Why, why are they all making istighfar? 
And Sayyidina Umar says, haven't you realized the ayah? فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُ رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا Then make istighfar, Allah is غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِدْرَارًا Then he'll send the rain down. وَيُمْدِرُكُمْ بِأَمْوَالِ وَبَنِينَ And he'll increase you in your amwal, in your wealth, and in your children. So what's needed is this istighfar. Especially in, in trying times and in difficult times when, the, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends these trials, we need to turn back to him. We need to turn back to him, not only from our sins. Returning, uh, making istighfar for sins is one level. The higher level is even making istighfar from our heedlessness of him. Just being heedless of him. And then they say we need to even make istighfar for the time we wasted. Even the time that we wasted, it's a ni'mah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And Allah tells us that we will we'll answer for it. Right? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. رأيت الذي يكذب بالدين فذلك الذي يدعو اليتيم ولا يحض على طعام المسكين فهو المصلين الذين هم عن صلاتهم سون الذين هم يرؤون ويمنعون الماء فقد the ayah where Allah سبحانه وتعالى says الهك متكاثر it's in in سورة كاثر حتى زرتم المقابر كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علم اليقين لترون ثم لا ترون عين ثم لا تسألون يوم إذا عن النعيم and that's the day in which you will be لا تسألون you will be asked of all of the his ni'mas Allah has given you. And if you haven't realized that time is a ni'mah, then you're dreaming. Ask someone who has passed away how much they would do for a moment. How they would just have one moment, just to turn to Allah. You will be asked on your time. You will be asked about your time. You will be asked about your time. And this is a ni'mah. And the, so all the time we've wasted, we need to make istighfar for it and to seek Allah's repentance and turn to him subhanahu wa ta'ala this is important in our in our in our in our istighfar and so you see the dua of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam he says inni zalamtu nafsi this is the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam speaking he says inni zalamtu nafsi i have wronged myself zulman kathiran right he says i've 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 wronged myself and he, he doesn't even just end there it's a, a big zulm, kathiran. Right? And he says, Ya Allah, you forgive me. You forgive you forgive me. Right? In, uh, you're the one who forgives. To tell you what, you need to be broken in front of him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Broken in front of him only. And beg him and plead with him that he can forgive us. And that he can raise our ranks. And take us out of the difficulty we find ourselves in. نعلامات الاعتماد على العمل نقصان الرجاء عند وجود زل. From the signs of one relying on their deeds, is that they lose hope when they fall or when they don't when they stop doing these deeds. This and this is obviously it needs the sincerity. This what we're talking about. This tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa taala, the repentance in Allah subhanahu wa taala needs the sincerity. It needs complete transparency with him. The story of um, Abu Sufyan al-Mughira. Abu Sufyan al-Mughira, his name was. And he was one of the people who would write poems against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And at every battle he was there in front. He was in front and he was... He was, you know, speaking against the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and after the or just before the Fath of Mecca, um, he comes and he he asked the Prophet sallallahu. He becomes a Muslim. He asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for forgiveness. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is finding it difficult to even look at him. He's given him so much, so much tribulation in his life, and this man al Mughira he goes to. Um, his uncle and he says, you know, can you talk to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Al-Abbas, right? Can you speak to him? He says, if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is angry with you, what can I do? He goes to Sayyidina Ali, he says, can you ask? Until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forgives him and then he becomes a Muslim. And he goes from that moment with the Muslims to all of the battles. And he goes to Hunayn. And Hunayn... 
Hunain, you, you know what happens in Hunain. Hunain, there is a lot of believers, uh, the, tul- the, the people who have just come to, into this religion, who is not so firm on the religion. And they're going into the battle, and as they're going, the Quraysh uh, or, or the enemy uh, catch them from the wrong side. Catch them from the wrong side, and suddenly they're shocked. And they're not sure what's happening. They're not sure what's happening, and a lot of them start running away. In fact, almost all start running away. Even the Sahaba who were strong and who were firm, seen everyone running away, they became scared and they all started running away. Until the narrations mentioned there were 17 on the front line of the Muslims. There's the enemy in front. The enemy is in front, there's 17 Muslims there. There's 17. 17, one of them is the Prophet wasallam, And the Prophet wasallam is on his mule and al mughira is holding it and standing firm. And he's standing firm. He's one of them holding it. And the Prophet wasallam tells them, start calling people back by their names you know you so and so come back so and so come back why because if i if they just say come back people are, are not going to listen but if i say you come and they know ah, direct command they have to so they start calling them back but they're 17 on the front line and then the the arabs who are known for some of, of for courage they are known for courage and they will write poems of courage and it's something like such so noble you know they 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 just they love it and it's something that they almost like obsessed with they mention it all the time and they say that that moment there was perhaps in the entire arab's history that moment of the prophet ﷺ was his most most courage, courageous that moment that moment because that's the scene they 17 there are 17 people uh, on the front line, there's the entire enemy on the f- in front of them. And the Prophet wasallam starts charging solely, alone, into all 17, uh, into all the entire army. He only has 17 be- uh, 16 behind him. Prophet wasallam starts charging alone. And uh, there's the, the, the Prophet wasallam says at that moment, which was recorded, he says, um, I am the Prophet, there's no doubt. And then Nabi Yula Kadib. I am the Nabi, there is no lie. And Ibn Abdul Muttalib, I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. And he's saying this and he's charging towards them. And then Nabi Yula Kadib, and Ibn Abdul Muttalib, I am the Nabi, there is no lie. And I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. And he goes and he charges alone saying this. And the Arabs say, perhaps this moment here was the moment of the most courage we've ever seen in our history. Of the Prophet ﷺ. but who was there holding? Mughira. Mughira. Until when he passes away in the time of Sayyidina Umar and he, they see him they see him digging a grave and see what's going on. He says, I'm preparing my grave in Baqi. This is for me. He says, I'm doing my preparation now. I've prepared it. And after he says, When I pass away, don't cry on me. He says, Don't cry on me. When I pass away, when I leave this world, don't cry on me. For Allah, since the moment I repented with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, I've never committed a sin since, a sin since then. From my moment I've, I've repented, I've never committed a sin. I'm okay, you cry, keep your tears, that's for you. I'm okay with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to meet him transparent. Right? Because why the, the, this istighfar he made was full of sincerity. And it wasn't just... Astaghfirullah, it was, I'm not going to do any sin again. It was that kind of an istighfar. And that's the istighfar we're trying to, to accomplish. And that's the istighfar we're trying to get. So, back on the, this hikmah of Ibn Atayilah, min alamat al-i'atimadi ala al-amal, nuqsan al-raja'a in the wujud al-zalal, that from the signs of one depending on his actions is that he loses hope in the wujud al-zalal when it falls apart. When he stops doing it, that's problematic to rely on your deeds. Why? Because you start comparing. You start comparing. You say, yeah, you know, he does this and I did this. And, you know, so suddenly you, you, you're comparing. Why? Because you're seeing your deeds. Oh, I have this many deeds. I, I done this. I done this. And you can compare. And failing to realize that it's not about the deeds. The deeds were just the means. 
someone could have much less deeds than you but be in a better situation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what's the proof for that the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it's a long hadith where he says that um, the angels are sent out and they look for a gathering of dhikr and when they find it they call other, all the other angels until the angels line up from there until the, uh, the heavens and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then asks the angels what do my slaves want and they reply they, they want Jannah and they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks the angels the hadith is sahih uh, have they seen Jannah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala asked, have they seen Jannah? The angels say, no, they haven't seen it. Allah asks, if they were to see it, how would they have remembered me then? How would they have seeked, sought it then? And the, the angels say, oh, they would have been even more vigorous. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what do they want provision? Uh, what do they want a provision to stay away from? And the angels say, Jahannam, they want to stay away from that. Allah says, have they seen it? No, they haven't. They would have been more vigorous if they seen it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then uh, I bear witness that I have forgiven all of them. I have forgiven all of them. And then the, this is the barakah of doing things in a group. Right? Allah says, I have forgiven all of them. What, one good person there. One good person, can, everyone can be forgiven. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the angels often say, um, that, but from them there's a man. You know, he wasn't really amongst them. He didn't actually come for the dhikr. He wasn't. He didn't intend. You know, he just found himself there. His intention wasn't there. Maybe he wasn't even present. He was just there, sitting there. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, All of his sins are forgiven. That they are the people. No one leaves there empty-handed when you sit with them. These are the qawm. These are the people of Allah. When you sit with them, the people of dhikr, when you sit with them, no one leaves empty-handed. No one's going to leave upset and sad from them. Right? No one is unfortunate if you're sitting with them. But what's, what's the point here? The, this, that we need to, to not look at these deeds. Why? Because here there's a man who's, who's not even done anything. He's just sat in the presence. And he could be forgiven and you could have all of your deeds. But you see them and it's all invalid. And this guy who does nothing versus you who has everything. All of your deeds and your sins and he might still be on a higher station with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point is not to see your deeds. The point is that you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the definition of ihsan. What we've been speaking about. Al-ihsan and ta'budallah ka'anna katara. You worship him as if you see what your deeds? No. You see yourself? No. You see Allah. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. La ilaha illallah. So, al is that you see and you worship Allah as if you are seeing Him. If you sing your deeds and you see, oh, I'm fasting now, oh, you know, alhamdulillah, that's great. I got my salah in order, alhamdulillah, I'm okay. If you think you're okay, that's a big problem. And the, the, there's a saying that all, all bad stems from thinking good of yourself. When you think you, when you're pleased with yourself, that's a better word to say. All bad stems from when you think, when you're pleased with yourself. I'm okay now. I can relax. And the good stems from not being pleased with yourself. I'm not good enough. I'm not doing it enough. I'm not worshiping Allah as if he, uh, as the way He needs, as the way that suits Him. Now, for not needs, Allah doesn't need anything. At a summit, doesn't need anything, but as um, suits Him. That's that's the highest station. Right? And that's, and that's ihsan, that you worship Allah as if you are seeing Him, not your deeds. Your deeds are not the, uh, are not the point, they're not the objective. And this is what um, Ibn Atayla is telling us, have tawakkul on Allah and not on your deeds. He's teaching us tawakkul here. Yeah. That's how we got into this conversation of the hikam, is that you, you have tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You realize that everything is from Him, 
and all your trials have come from him and your tribulations have come from him and he's the only one who can remove it. And in the first place he said, he told us that it won't, it won't even overwhelm, me, overwhelm you. Allah won't try a person more than they can bear. More than they can bear. So you have a problem, you better believe that you can bear it and you can come over it. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you could. He's not going to give you something, something more than you can bear. And even in your problems, there is rahmah. SubhanAllah, even in your problems, in your difficulty, in your tribulation, Allah is still kind enough to give you something you can manage. There is blessings even in your tribulation and even in the difficulty you find. This is, that's what the tawakkul is talking about. That's what the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. That's why you see the ayah in Surah Nahal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ that whoever does righteous actions, min dhakarin or unta, whoever does righteous actions from the male and the female, wa huwa mu'minun, and is a believer. Right? It's not just good enough to, to just, okay, we're doing good, but it's this iman, this practical version of believing. Wa huwa mu'min, falinuhiyannahu hayatan tayyibah. Allah says then we will give them a, a, a life which is easy in the sense of tranquil. Not in the sense of no tribulation, in the, in the sense of happiness, sa'ada, you have that. You have that, which is the primary objective. You ask anybody, why are you doing something? The end goal will be, be so I can be happy. They might give you many answers before that. Why do you work? So I can get wealth. Well, why do you want wealth? So I can have a house. Why do you want a house? Ugh, so I can house my family. Okay, why do you want a family? Mm, so I can have children. Okay, why do you want children? At the end, the last point will be so I can be happy. That would be the point. Everyone is doing things as that objective. And so you have to ask yourself, what makes you happy? What would make a person happy? That's Imam Ghazali. He, he puts it beautifully. He says, you think the senses of this world can make you happy? And the best drink you can find is water. Just to put things into perspective, it's water. The best uh, food you could get is honey. And honey is just excrements of a bee. And he says, the best cloth you could get is silk. And silk comes from a worm. And he says, all of your material senses, all of it, all of your outward senses come from things which are absolutely insignificant. So he says, what actually makes someone happy? And he says that it's servitude to other people. It's, it's the servitude. And in Arabic, there's actually a relationship. I know in the first week, we were speaking about root words. Sa'id, the one who is happy. And Sa'ada is to help people. You, you become happy through helping people. And they done a study where they found, I think it was in America, they done the study, the study where they found that when people are doing khidma, when people are helping, that the, the, they put... Um, what I can imagine would be an EEG or something. Or, and they found that the points that were stimulated in the brain were the points where happiness derives. When people were helping people, that's what made them happy. It's Sa'ada and Sa'id. That's what's going to make you happy. That's, that's the primary objective. Allah says, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكْرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَلَنُحْيَنَّهُ حَيًا Then we will make them happy. But what do you need to do? You need to do amal salih. We already said Allah commands you to do the Amal Salih. And as soon as you finish the Amal Salih, you perfect it. And you try to improve it and you try to make it better and better and better. And then you forget about it because you don't want to depend on it. Then you have wa huwa mu'min. So you do have the good actions and you're a believer. Then Allah will make you happy. That's an equation. If you have good actions, if you're, if you're a true believer, you have happiness. If you find something wrong, so if you say, ah, I'm not happy, that side of the formula Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed. What do you need to do? Go check the other side. How's your belief? How's your belief? Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, may Abdullah ala harf. Abdullah ala harf. Some people worship Allah on the edge. And they be, we believe us, but on the edge. Something just come touch you, gone, it falls down. Falls down. Abdullah ala harf. There is a problem with the iman. There is a problem with the iman. The practical aspect of it. 
perhaps we could have all the information of Iman and know exactly what makes us Muslims, but it's all sitting in the head and it hasn't yet descended into the heart. And so we're trying to purify our heart and have this Qalb Salim to receive this information and to accept it. So you might have a problem in your, in your, uh, in your belief or the, pro- the problem might go the other way, it might be in your actions. You need to see where's your actions. Right? If you want to see where you stand with Allah, see where Allah stands with you. If you want to see where you stand with Allah, what's my rank with Allah? What's my station with Allah? See where Allah stands with you. Where do you put Allah in your day? Where do you prioritize Allah in your day? Are you giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your left over time? I need to first do my work. After I do my work, I need some relaxing time. And then I need to eat. And then I just want to, again, relax a bit, play something. you know. And then I think I have about 20 minutes. I'm going to give it to Quran. You're left over time. Well, I found this 20 minutes. I'll, or in, in, is it the fact that you said, no, no, I'm going to do this regardless what's happening. Whether I'm, I have work or not, I need to read Quran in this time. Where, where do you put Allah? Where do, where's you, Allah in your day? If you want to see where you stand with Allah, you need to see where Allah stands with you. Where do you want to place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? This is, this is the formula for this happiness. Whatever tribulation comes, whatever trial comes, this is the formula. With this tawakkul and this, this belief and this, uh, this uh, actions and this good character and with this tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you, you're okay, then you have your happiness. You have what you're after. What will make this world easy, what will make the biggest challenges seem insignificant. It's this, uh, this formula. This is, this is the, the, the tawakkul you see with the companions. Of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he comes and he gives his entire wealth, his entire wealth. Sometimes we think, you know, you see these celebrities now in Corona, they've given thirty percent of their of their wealth, of their income. You earning millions, thirty percent is literally nothing. It's easy to give that. It's easy for you to give that. Sayyidina Abu Bakr comes and he gives it all. Everything, everything he gives to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he gives it all to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they ask him, what have you left? And Prophet says, what have you left for your family? He says, I've left Allah or Rasul. I've left them Allah and the Messenger. That's what they need. They don't need the money. Allah will give them more. Allah will give them more. But what do they need? They need Allah and the Messenger. You know, you'll see on TV, um, what have you left for your family? Life insurance. What have you left for your family? Have, can I take this, you can leave them 100,000. Have you left them Allah and the Messenger? Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Ali, when he slept in the, just to go quickly since we're out of time, Sayyidina Ali, just to, uh, when he slept in the bed of the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, knowing that people are coming to kill, that bed is going to be a heat map. The people are coming to kill that, whoever is in that bed. And he sleeps and he sleeps easy in that bed. Trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Abu Bakr when he goes on the on, on the hijrah and he's leaving with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he becomes fearful. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, La tahsan inna Allah ma'ana. Don't be scared Allah is with us. Don't be scared Allah is with us. Musa alayhi salam, he goes, he goes with his entire ummah. The enemy of Fir'aun behind them, they come to the ocean, they say, oh, now we doomed. We doomed. We doomed. This, on one end, we got um, the, the entire the entire army of Fir'aun behind, and in the front we got the ocean. What do we do? He says, they say we doomed. Uh, Musa alayhi salam says, Kalla inna ma'ya rabbi. Indeed, with me is Allah. Say yahdin, he'll guide me. He'll guide me. Complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Complete trust such that it will split oceans. That kind of iman and tawakkul will split oceans. Such trust that the the fire becomes cool. Such trust that the knife doesn't cut, it becomes blunt. Such such trust that even the whale doesn't kill you. That's the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And last point um, before we end the series, I think it's the last um, lecture in the series of this qalb salim, the sound heart where we've already spoke about, so just to recap, we spoke about 
your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your patience with him and your tawakkul on him. And then they, they say what we also need is your husnul dhan billah. That you, you have this husnul dhan, this good thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Husnul dhan. At, in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Ana inda dhani abdi bi. I am in the opinion of my slave. I'm in the opinion of my slave. If if you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, and he's going to forgive you, then that's that's what you'll find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why there was a, a scholar who said that, uh, who had never spoken of the punishment of Allah in the Quran. He used to give lectures and he used to give about Jannah and all of that, and he never ever spoke of the punishment. And they used to wonder, like, why? And when he went, allegedly, so there is no sinad. Allegedly, when he goes to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he asks Allah, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask him, why have you never spoken about my punishment? He said, Ya Allah, I wanted to remind them of your uh, compassion and your love to them and they turn to you through that. So that they don't find you, you know, just become fearful of you only. Just so they're fearful of you only. Right? Because the point is that we have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's never a hopeless moment. There is never a hopeless moment. And we'll end on the example of Khadija radiallahu an, anha. If you want the example of um if you want the example of Husnudan, the Prophet وسلم, received the revelation and she comes he comes back to her and he says, I fear for myself. And she says, Wallah la yuqsik Allah abada. Never. Allah will never dishonor you. She has the highest thinking of him sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam because she knows him innaka la tasilu rahim she says you you do this and you do that and you do that you do that so this husn dhan that we have with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we realize that everything that we do we hope in him subhanahu wa ta'ala for the best we hope in him for the best it doesn't matter wa idha qila lahum taqu madha anzala rabbukum qalu khair when you ask them what has your lord sent they say khair uh, it's all good right? it's all good in the hood Right, you in good hands. The world is in good hands. Everyone is in good hands because they're in the hands of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He's Al Hakim and He's doing everything with wisdom. And all of your affairs are in good hands. And all of your lives are in good hands. And all of the world is in good hands. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhammad Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Taala Wa Barakatuh.